Welcome to this week's MTD podcast. We will be discussing finance and the economy during the COVID-19 crisis. I'm Giovanni Albanese, hosting today's show, a passionate engineer and a proud member of the MTD team. I'm joined today by two special guests. Firstly, the one, the only, the Silver Fox, Colin Griffiths, the director of the network, MTD Network, who's been working tirelessly trying to win our engineers in the UK more work during this turbulent time. We also have the pleasure to be joined by Paul Cox, the director of Asset Finance, who's been in engineering and been involved with supplying finance to engineers since 2006. Welcome to the NTD podcast, guys. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Colin, I'm going to start with uh, you. Colin, you know, you used to be uh, in finance prior to joining NTD, so you're very familiar with, with um, the finance industry. Um, how important is finance at this moment in time? Well, a, a few things, Gio. First of all, I'm not sure about Silver Fox, if you could co- stop using that reference. They're, they're actually natural highlights. But um, <laughs> moving on, we, we are, this, I think this is going to be quite controversial because it is – something that very close to people's hearts is finance. And generally, when we speak to people about finance, it sort of eyes glaze over. But now is a key to it because at the moment, I'd say 75% of our engineers are really busy working hard doing all these parts. 25%, I mean, rough figures, quiet. The 25% are going to stop getting money and they need support for their banks. On the, bus- on the other side, where they're really busy, they're going to need money because potentially their clients won't, their, their people they're supplying to won't be able to pay them. They are going to need support from the banks. And I have seen massive lack of support. I mean, I saw a post from a high street bank this morning saying we're here to help five easy steps. And you know what? None of the comments were even vaguely polite about support. So, but I want to take another step back. Sorry. Um, talk about support for business. And this is very brief. So we'll talk about finance and the economy. But I was chatting to Steve Weiss, Steve Weiss from Mainland Engineering, having a cracking time at the moment, very, very, very busy. Um, he's had to do a couple of, fur- well, one or two furloughs, unfortunately. But he said, you know what? Lack of information, not just about finding about how to run the business and things like that and what we should be, not run the business, but what we should be doing these times. He said he got a great letter on the 8th of April. I know it's a few few days ago now. I can't give you the link because it's about three days long, but he said it just summarised the information he needs. So we can put that link on the podcast just if you need a little bit of guidance i think we're all probably there now because that's what two three weeks ago you know a little while ago but great great help but it's ultimately it's saying engineering is an essential service you can still work if you can do safely so colin you've obviously been visiting uh well in contact shall i say remotely with your engineering network the end users within the uk um, you know, you work closely with Paul Cox. You, you've known Paul um, for a long time. Um, Paul, you know, what, how have you been finding things, you know, out there at the minute? I think it's, it's been a very challenging time for everybody, and that's quite an understatement. Um, I think I'll reiterate what Colin said. Uh, the frustration with um, companies and business owners um, is there's a lot of rhetoric about funding that's available, uh, but uh, the reality is it's getting access to that funding. And we've seen time and time again, you've only got to pick up the um, well, newspaper or certainly go online and you can see that only a small percentage of people are actually getting this government money that's that's been out there under the C-Bill scheme. Sorry, what does C-Bill stand for, just for those who aren't aware? So the C-Bill stands for Coronavirus Business Interruption Lending Scheme. Uh, there's two levels of it. There's the SME market and then the, the, then there's the larger market. But we're predominantly talking about C-bills. The C-bills is yeah, essentially for the SME, so, which is where a lot of our engineers sit. Yeah, very much so. I mean, if you sort of take a, I, I take a broad brush on this sort of business in sub sort of 10 million. Um, well, I think it's about 15 million, actually, is, 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 the, is the parameter. But um, certainly sub 10 million, which probably encompasses 95% of any of our businesses that we deal with. Colin, you mentioned that 75% or rough figures um, of the engineers that you're currently communicating with um, seem to be very busy. Um, so why do this? Why does this 75% still need funding? I'm, I'm a little bit lost there, Colin. 
it's it's all about cash flow, Geo. So they're, they're really really busy. They've got to buy their stock. They've got to pay their their suppliers. But then they'll send that stock out the door. Are they going to get paid? Normally, they might get paid in thirty days. But the people they're supplying that to, they might not be getting paid. It's a, it's a knock on effect down the whole whole supply chain. So instead of getting paid in thirty days, they're getting paid in sixty days or ninety days. That will affect their cash flow. So they can't pay their HPs, their loans and things like that. So they need that buffer just to cover them over over the next three to six months. And that's where the banks have got to step up and be open, transparent, but more, well, contactable. So with that in mind, what if someone, even if they're not in pro- problems at the moment, it, you know, it'd be pertinent to get in contact, what would the process be, Paul? Sorry, can't get that. In, in terms of getting hold of money, well, yeah, I mean, is the first point of call with their bank or to you or what, what would you, you know, suggest? So we sit in the broker market, so um, uh, which is um, quite a strong um, uh, a strong degree of fu- funding for people. But um, this directive that we've been given is businesses really contact their uh, main um, uh, provider, bank provider first. So they're the ones that have been uh, given access. The high streets have been access to the government money under the C-bill schemes. So they should be contacting them first. And in majority of cases, they are doing that. OK, can I ask a question then? You contact your bank and feedback, just look like you said earlier, feedback online is four to six weeks. All I've had is a couple of emails and a couple of texts saying we'll be in contact. Four to six weeks is not quick enough. You're going to be running out of cash by then. So what... What else can they do? So um, let me just break C bills down a little bit more. So C bills is effectively funding. It's a fund of, a fund of money that people can um, request for, and they have to um, they have to go through a normal uh, proposal with the bank um, who's or the banks they're with um, in terms of applying for a, a pot of money. But there's if I break it down to there's C bills which is loans. It could be for overdrafts. It could be for asset finance and potentially it could be for invoice finance as well. It all depends what the customer's requirements are. If it's for purchasing equipment, it could be just for asset finance. If it's for cash flow, it could be most of the time it's going to be for lending, but it also could really be for overdrafts and invoices, and invoice financing as well. Uh, Paul, um, you mentioned asset finances. Um, obviously, prior to, to the COVID-19 crisis, um, you were supplying finance for people to effectively buy new machinery. Um, now, are you still seeing people investing in new machinery at this moment in time? Well, surprisingly, Colin sort of touched on this earlier on. He's saying as a number of his customers that are still very busy and they're being strangle, uh, they've got a stranglehold because they don't have access to the money. So they're actually saying we've got orders in but we can't complete the orders because we don't have cash. So the the simple answer is, yes, I am seeing new business still come through. Um, Not as much I normally would, but there are still some positive um, uh, companies out there that that are looking to invest in new equipment because their order books are full. So they have not taken advantage that they've been in a position where their business has taken advantage of the current situation. What do you think of this, Colin? Well, I just want to clarify with Paul because you, you said the route was go to your bank, see bills. Again, I want to reiterate that they're you know they're not geared up for the amount of applications yet. I mean, there's real dis, dis, disconcert, whatever the word is, with the high street banks at the moment. But they they kind of preempted what was going on here. But still, they're not stepping up up their game. But if I've applied for this, you know, if I've done my application, and I still haven't heard after four to six weeks, you know. Can I still can I come to you, for example? Is that the next route, or am I are my hands tied? I have to go to the C bills option first. No, your hands aren't tied. I mean, the biggest problem we're having is the volume. So the banks can't cope with the actual volume that's coming through, um, and because of this, they're getting huge delays. The other thing is, as everybody's aware, we're working from home, so they haven't got the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure that they're actually used to. So this is also impacting on their ability to deal with the volumes. But um, yes, you, we, we advise that the route to go through is through your bank. But if you're not getting any uh, any response or, or any or any help from your bank, then yes, uh, come come to us in the broker market. Now we do have 
um, a number of funders that have been accredited to actually um, to, to to use the Seabills money. So you have to re- you have to request to the government um, to to be able to be Seabills uh, accredited. So then you can actually then obviously then lend this money out to your customers. So not every lender um, in the broker market will have access to Seabills money. But we do have lenders that will have access to loan money, asset finance money and invoice finance money as well. Paul, you know, you, you mentioning actual uh, lending of money or kind of grants, if you like. But if, if this seems to be such a delayed or there seem to be such a delayed response in this due to the high volumes, is there any kind of repayment holidays or, or on their on their premises, on their machinery, um, on anything that they have? on finance that can maybe tide them over so it reduces their outgoings during this period? I think there's three elements that probably I can sort of separate things um, just just to give a bit more clarity because there is a bit of confusion over this. So the first thing you mentioned grants, these are not grants. There is grant money that's available, but grant but that's um, awarded by your local councils. If you um, are a small business owner, you're paying a small business rates. So that's grant money, and that doesn't necessarily need to be paid back, but please look at the T's and C's. That comes from your local council. Then there is what we call the three-month payment holiday. So most of the funders, uh, if you've got an agreement, a loan, or a mortgage, or asset finance, they pretty much, I haven't heard any cases where they haven't agreed a three-month payment holiday. But as you can imagine, that's going to come to an end very, very soon. So the one that's really pressing and the one that's that's really uh, on people's minds is the C-bills, which is the loan scheme. And that's where we're having the issue with the banks. The banks can't cope with the volume. So, you know, the, 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 the next route really is to say, well, who else can help us? Well, it's the broker market that can help you. We do have access to money. Can you give us any examples of this? Well, I think... Couple of th- couple of things there. I mean, I, was, I I won't name who it was, but um, I, I was on the phone to an engineer the other day, and he was he was absolutely desperate. It's a great engineering company. It is successful, but short term cash flow. And he's like, I've spoken to my bank. I don't have a relationship manager anymore. This is a story faced by you hear it all the time, and they're just not coming to the party. I have got my three month repayment holidays, but I need some more help. And I think the great thing was phone Paul, as in Paul here, and. It's all about communication, responding, and having that conversation. And you were straight on the phone to, to him, helped him out, gave him a bit of peace of mind, and we're able to give him a bit of guidance. And that's, I think that's that's what people want. They don't want to be, yeah, we'll call you in a, a week, and then it's another three weeks. They want to speak to somebody, even if it's a yes or a no, or maybe they want some guidance. Absolutely. And I think that's where people like Paul stand up, and they're, they're available, and they can really, really help. So, Paul, are you uh, are you available for all these engineers to contact you can we supply them with your details yeah most definitely i mean what what i will point out is you know we we don't have a magic wand we can say you will get the money it still needs to be a viable proposition um and you need to do a proper a full proposal uh, which is where i will assist and help you so you'll need to provide things like your bank statements and your um your latest trading accounts and the rationale for what you're what you're looking to do with the money that's a given but yes, you know our our, our offering is usually very quicker, uh, very much very quicker than the banks, and um, although it has had an impact in terms of what's been happening, we don't have as much direct access. But you know, Colin's given an example. I chatted to somebody um, a couple of days back, and um, I'm just waiting on information to come back to me before I can get a proposal up the line. So you know, it is a viable route, and we do have access to money. Um, and clearly a lot quicker than the banks do. Yeah, Colin, I mean, this, these are really valid points, aren't they? Absolutely. Well, I've got, I mean, I had a few points I want to discuss prior to, the, prior to this, but something that's come to mind while we've been on the podcast, R&D tax relief. I know Paul can, we can liaise with Paul, people can liaise with Paul and have to sort that out, but we're actually looking at that as a company. Not, we were prior to the lockdown, we were looking at this anyway, but it's a great way to reduce your tax bill and get tax credits back, but that can help your cash flow. And it is, in the scheme of things, a relatively simple process. So I'm just throwing it out there as another source just to help that cash flow. Paul, you're available for, for basically the initial contact on that as well, I understand. 
Yeah, very much. We've seen it. We've seen an uplift in inquiries for R and D tax, and it's some it's a drum I've been banging for many many years, really, because it's it's free money in effect. It's money you've paid out in, in terms of your own business for through tax, and um, if you're eligible, then you can claim some of that money back. But I'd always say um, look at a professional company rather than just looking at your own accountant, because accountants do accounts and R and D, whereas professional R and D just do R and D tax credits. So that's what they're geared up to do. So it's a way of getting money back into your business. And at the moment, cash is king, isn't it? That's that's what's that, what's becoming the biggest problem. And I think that's a really valid point, Paul. I think that people that are not aware of R and D, it's when you're investing money into R and D, into research and development, into manufacturing your pro- products or processes within your manufacturing facility, which I would imagine most engineering facilities do now. Paul, I would imagine you've got some kind of inside banking information in regards to kind of uh, a prediction, if you like, uh, in regards to when this will be all over. Have you got? Is that is that true, or 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 are we still all? Is is it still all unknown? I I would love to put my Merlin's hat on, but unfortunately, I don't have that facility. It it is an unknown, and I was talking to Colin um, earlier. It is it is changing week by week, day by day, even, um, and it's adjusting because uh, you know it, it'll change again because the the government money is not getting through to the people that need it, which are the companies. So there'll have to be some changes there as well. We are one route, but they're, they're going to have to make some bigger changes so that money filters down quick, work quickly. So in terms of it's you know a time scale, couldn't give you a time scale, but I would say you know you've got to be thinking more long term. You've certainly got to be thinking. The best part of this year and, and 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 going into next year because you know we haven't got a vaccination that's going to take some time to get through so social distances distancing is going to have a major impact for quite some time there's a number of di- different elements that feed into this but please don't think short term this is a long-term thing absolutely i think that the fact that these funds etc are all available really just emphasize that really it, it's it's totally unprecedented times now this is not just affecting the engineers that we deal with. It's affecting everybody in the world. Um, you know, how is it affecting the economy, Colin? Well, I've been doing doing some research, as you'd expect. So I want to cover off a few a few key points. So, first of all, you know, you mentioned about how long it's going to take to recover and things like that. I've got a figure that to come to us later. But I was I was looking at previous recessions because I'm an interesting guy like that. I know. Um, <laughs> You know, for big, big recession, 1929. Where was that, do you reckon? That was so, America. Yeah, America was, gentlemen, absolutely. So lasted into the 1930s. So that's real doom and gloom. Sorry about that. Next one, 1970. Well, there's, there's been others, of course, but 1973. And do you know what this sort of, why this came about? Any any ideas, Paul? Uh, to do with um, oil? Absolutely, yes. It because they they bunged up the bunged up, they put up the oil price because of the support of Israel in 1973. Now, next one, I'm going to put you on the spot, Geo. 1979. Why did that? Why was there a recession then? Well, it's usually to do with oil, so I'm going to go with oil again, Colin. <laughs> Geo, absolutely. To quote you, <laughs> the now you two are probably well, actually, Coxie. You're probably old enough to remember that. So, but the next one, I'm going to go back to Paul. 1980. Well, not the next one, but this isn't a, a, con, a, a full list of them all, but just a few. 1989. What happened then, Paul? Do you reckon what was the result of a recession then? Uh, I know what the result was. The house, the house market absolutely crashed because I was caught up in it. Ah, well, I'll come to some. I'll come to some interesting facts on that later. But what do you think caused it? Um, I would say stock market related, but I couldn't give you some specifics. Oh, look at that. He's been doing his research. Absolutely. Stock market grossly overpriced. And don't quote me on all of these. These are just sort of a very generic quote statement. So if someone, if an, a professor of economics comes on and says, well, that's slightly wrong, I will bow to his better judgment, of course. Um, next one, 1997. Gio, what do you reckon? Wow. Um I really don't know, Colin. I really don't know, mate. Thank you for your valid input there. I think this was actually, if I gave you, um, what was his name? Was it Nick Nick Gleason, was it? Uh, Leeson? Who's the bloke who was over in Singapore and did the bunk because he spent all their money? 
Oh, yes, I can remember that on the news. Yes, I can, Colin. That's right. I'm sure it wasn't. He got locked up. He did. I think he's now living in Ireland and doing um, uh, talks to people. But I think that actually started around that time. It was start, It was due to the Thailand not pegging its currency to the US dollar. But then that had a knock-on effect all around Asia. Anyway, next one, 2007. Paul, Mr. Cox, I'll ask you, what happened in 2007? Well, that's what we call the banking or the financial crisis, 2007. So um, that was very much blamed on, um, on the banks. Absolutely. The Big Short, great film and a great book, if you're so inclined. Basically, and this is a, this is a very controversial statement, they had some high-level products sold by a bunch of idiots who didn't actually understand what they were selling. They weren't. They were selling. They were. I won't go into the the, the, the um, deep understanding of the product because I don't really have it. But they were selling off these subprime mortgages, packaging them up, selling them on. They were worth absolutely nothing, and making these people making a fortune. And then someone spotted that this was all going to fall over, and they made some money back of it. But it brought the you know it brought um, banks down and all sorts. So anyway, enough of that. The doom doom and gloom. But. A lot of those things were oil price related. What happened on the 20th of April, 2020? Negative Jim? price oil. The, the oil, for the first time in, in, in history, was in a negative, Colin. Absolutely. They, people, they, they are producing so much at the moment, and it's not being used, obviously. People don't want it. So and I, uh, uh, they've, got to pay to, they've got to take it on. They've got to pay to store it. So they're not, they don't want it. So it's, you know... Unprecedented times. Where are we going to move? Where are we going to go from here? So we've had oil, we've had financial markets. This is obviously a, a pandemic. So how are we going to move forward? Do you know how long it takes? I'm going to throw this one at you, Paul. Generally, to take to recover from a recession, three to four years. So no, no not four to five years. Not a big session, Paul, on a Friday night. A recession. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so four to five years. Well, 41 months, so three and a half years, so not a bad guess. So now another thing is interest rates. Now, looking at – I I know I sound like a complete nerd here. I'd I'd like to bore you with the fact that I actually – well, I look back at interest rates down to about the 1970s. When do you think they peaked? And we're looking at base rate here, the Bank of England base rate. Gio, when do you reckon they peaked? Between 1970 and now. I reckon it would have been not long after, um, I reckon, the, the 1980s, Colin. God, that's very broad. I'll give you that one. Uh, 1981, 15.13% as a base rate. So you'd be paying mortgage rates around 20%. People losing that. Yeah, they were getting in negative equity at the time, weren't they? It was a bad state of affairs. It certainly was. And we'll come to that in a minute because Paul Cox has already alluded to that. <laughs> <laughs> Prices. But base rate at the moment, where is it? I'll ask you, Mr. Cox. 0.1. There you go. He knows his stuff. And that is really, really upset me because the day they lowered that rate, I'd sent some paperwork in and I locked my fixed rate mortgage in the day before they lowered that interest rate. So I'm fuming. But anyway, moving on. I'm not, I'm, I'm, whoa. anyway, that's another story. Now, I mentioned all this. So we've got previous recessions. How long will it go on for? Interest rates. Interest rates affect Everybody, absolutely. Well, I'd say majority of people, you've all got a mortgage, but also your house prices. Now, some quick facts on house prices. Now, I've been doing some more research because obviously I'm really bored here. Now, to, to January this year, average house price increases were 1.3% for the year. So, ticking up. So, what do you reckon the average house price value is, Geo, at the moment, prior to this? Ooh, um that's a good question, Colin. I know. 200,000, 200,000? Well, that's, that's, very, that's very generous of you, Jay, because I've seen your mansion, and you, you've got to be tipping all my experience of yours. Yeah, average, yeah, I suppose average price, 231,000. Now, taking a step back, this is going to be to Mr. Cox here. 1989, I think you alluded that you got caught up. The peak price up to that period was 60, well, rounding up 63,000 pounds. God, what could you buy for a house that... For sixty-three thousand pounds now, but what do you think it it fell to over the coming recession, Paul? If the peak if the peak was sixty-three, yeah, it probably have fell fallen by about thirty percent. Ooh, so how, how, if you don't mind me asking, and people are going to hear this, how did it affect you personally? Um, no, that that point in time, I lost my house. 
bloody hell. Mm. It just it just went too far. So I was in huge negative equity, and unfortunately, I lost my house because I lost my job as well. Wow. This is this is a cheery story, but not this particular one. But this is a cheery podcast, by the way. But the actual. Just an overall figure, twenty percent price reduction. Two thousand and seven, the next sort of big price fall, obviously the financial crisis. House prices on average one hundred eighty four thousand. Geo, what do you reckon they fell to? I'd say it'd be similar to to to, to previous twenty twenty percent reduction. Oh, good guess, Geo. Yeah, one hundred. Well, rounding rounding up or down, one hundred fifty thousand. So about nineteen percent reduction. So I've seen forecasts that this will affect house prices by about 13%. So, again, it's not doom and gloom. You're in your house. You're happy. You've still hopefully still got a job. You're not paying rent. Keep going. Keep strong. But what I'm, what I'm talking about here is interest rates are really, really low. So people should be taking advantage where they can afford it to borrow, I think. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing. Yeah, it, it, borrowing is still going to be very cheap in comparatively. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good opportunity to actually do that, to get yourself – in, in a stronger position further on down the line. I mean, I am no economist, and so I'd always say take advice, but it seems the obvious thing to do. Absolutely. And one thing I'm going to say here as well is, I mean, those were some quite, well, I thought quite interesting figures. Hopefully they weren't too negative, but I've seen talking to a lot of engineers and a lot of OEMs as well. Now is a great time because they've looked at different processes and they're streamlining those processes, thinking how, you know, now is it a time for us to reflect how can we work better and work different? And they've, they've seen ways that, you know what, we can do this differently and going forward, that's the way we'll be doing it. They're streamlining their business. So I think when this ends, and as Paul predicted in three weeks' time, I'm joking, Paul, obviously not. <laughs> I wish. When it does end, people, businesses, there'll be a big surge. I mean, don't quote me on this. This is just my opinion and probably no one taking notice, there will be a big surge in demand. People will be more efficient, more profitable. I think it's a great, great opportunity. But there's me having a little rant. Gio, what do you reckon? Well, Colin, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised, really. I thought that was very interesting. You were right. Um, and I think that uh, I think that Martin Lewis has got some competition on his hands. <laughs> um, in, 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 Martin Lewis, the money expert. Uh, yeah, um, but... Um, from what you just mentioned there in regards to OEMs, end users alike, manufacturers, I think that, you know, there is also, where whatever the situation, the only thing that's ever certain in life is change. And change also creates opportunity. So in this, in this moment in time, there's still lots of opportunity out there. Um, and as you mentioned, Colin, quite rightly, I think it's a perfect opportunity for engineers to re-educate themselves, to look at their current processes, to look at how they can produce components more efficiently, how they can present more components to the spindle, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same situation. And we've all got to just try and remain as positive as we possibly can. Uh, but, no, very interesting, Colin. Thank you. And I think I think another key po- – yeah, I've gone on with all those facts and figures and things like that, but I think – key to this is what we alluded to earlier things are changing all the time you a lot of people are going to need finance you you just want to talk to somebody so i think that's great where paul can stand in and go actually just pick up the phone to me you might not like the answer because i can't help you but you'll be open and honest and there's someone there to talk to i don't know what do you think on that paul well um i think what i will start start with is what, what Gio said earlier on, I think, is is crucial and key, and we're seeing it already, already, people diversifying. Now, I know it's because they're helping out with the PPE at the moment, but how quickly have some companies diversified? And and I think that's the key to, um, to, to coming through this. It's being agile and being able to make those changes and those changes quickly. So I think there are a lot of positives actually going forward. I think companies that do come through this will be the stronger companies. You know, they're the ones that have got the foresight uh, and they're the ones that will be, be be here at the end of it and will benefit most definitely. Um, you know, there's there's no two ways about it. We, we're, we're in the middle of this and we've got some very, very tough times ahead. But it doesn't mean to say it's all going to be negative. So, you know, there is access to money. Money is available. Uh, and if you're not getting it through your high street bank, then um, use somebody like, like me, hopefully me. Please contact me. 
And then, I, like Colin said, I will give you a very honest and straight answer and a quick answer as well is in terms of is it something that we can support you with or not? And certainly, if I can't support you, I'll point you in a direction where I think somebody could. Uh, Paul, well, we can only but thank you for, for sharing your expertise um, on the MTD podcast. And it's fantastic um, that you're offering your time to the engineers out there. And I think it's it's just absolutely so important as well. It's not just your, your time. It's, it, again, it's your expertise. People don't know who to call to, don't know who to speak to. They phone up their bank and they're waiting to speak to someone for three, four hours. And when they finally get through, they're not through to the right person. So it's absolutely brilliant that you can offer your services to the engineers out there that really do need um, help. I totally agree with what you just said as well, Paul. I think that, you know, diversity and, and adapting to the current situation is absolutely key. And what we've also been finding at MTD is the people that are investing in the latest technology and innovation seem to be kind of leapfrogging ahead not that anyone's going you know not not that it's a competition but they seem to be adapting a lot better especially with being able to run 24 7 unmanned shifts for for example um it's something that you know you need to continually invest in the latest technology um to progress in in my opinion paul colin any last thoughts let's start with you paul yeah one thing to be aware of um you know banks make their money by lending money now, at the moment, the CBOs money is money from the government. So they make their real money by lending what we call their own money, new money. So don't be scared if you've got projects that you're, you know, you want to push forward and it's new borrowing for new equipment and such like. Don't think you're not going to get the money because you're because we're in this current situation. Banks are still open to do new money. And I'm still very much open to actually do new proposals for you. I mean, uh, the, the key thing I would say is, yes, it's tough, but you've got to be positive and, and, Absolutely. and you know, see what's out there. Take take notice of what's out there, you know, and, and, and streamline your business accordingly. You know, it's in your control. Paul, brilliant advice. Thank you very much. Colin, any last thoughts? Well, I've, I've done all the serious stuff. This is a, it's a very serious statement. Though. Um, Paul, I don't suppose you can lend me a couple of quid, could you? <laughs> well, we need to put a proposal forward, Colin. <laughs> uh, guys thank you very much for participating in the mtd podcast if you've listened to this podcast and you have any questions whatsoever don't hesitate to contact paul cox directly he's very active on linkedin and you'll be able to connect with him on linkedin contact colin for any inquiries in regards to winning new work through the mtd network um, and don't forget to subscribe to the MTD podcast, which you can quite simply do using your iPhone or smartphone or even listen to it on the MTD website. Until next week, um, the MTD podcast. Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.